I'm going to go ahead and jump right in and give you this whole sermon in one sentence. You ready? Are you ready? Yes. Only God can call forth your identity and destiny. And the title for the message this weekend is The Name Game. Write that down. The Name Game. Only God can call forth your identity and destiny. And I'm going to start with John 10.10 10 this morning. If I've said John 10.10 10 once, I've said it a thousand times around here. Jesus speaking says that the thief has only come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and life more abundant, life to the full. Well, we know the life that Jesus came to bring us, don't we? We talk about it all the time around here at Soma Church. The life of Jesus Christ is a life of peace. It's a life of joy. It's a life filled with hope. Amen? It's what the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has brought us. But the devil, he is a thief. And his plan for our lives, and yes, he does have a plan, it's the exact opposite of God's plan. He doesn't want to bring us anything. All he wants to do is take from us. Everything the devil does is the antithesis of what God is doing or how God is working in our lives, right? Satan is like the reverse flash. Everyone know who the flash is? Raise your hand if you know who the flash is. Not as many people as I thought would raise their hand. Let me tell you, the flash is a superhero who saves the day with his lightning fast super speed. The reverse flash is a super villain who threatens the day with his super speed. You get it? Let me give you a little more. The flash, this superhero is characterized by being very good. He's a, he's a very morally driven person. He's kind, he's caring, He's considerate. He's compassionate. He is a servant-hearted giver who only wants to help everyone around him. The reverse flash is the complete opposite. The reverse flash is a jerk <laughs> who only wants to rule the world. He is selfish. He's full of hate, full of revenge, 100% heartless, cares only about himself. The reverse flash is a selfish hearted taker who wants to hurt everyone around him. The flash has a really awesome red super suit with a yellow lightning bolt on his chest. The reverse flash has a totally lame <laughs> yellow super suit with a red lightning bolt on his chest. In every way, he's the reverse of all that the flash is, of all that the flash represents and lives for. I'm surprised he doesn't run backwards. Now, I want you to listen to me. I'm fully aware that the flash isn't real. Okay? I'm not deluded. Which means that the reverse flash isn't real. Right? Everybody knows nobody can run as fast as those guys can run. And we all know that people don't walk around wearing skin-tight leather outfits. Well, that's not actually true. <laughs> but nobody can run that fast, right? I think that some people believe or don't believe that the enemy is real. That Satan is real. I'm talking about Christians, Christians that don't believe that Satan is real, or maybe they believe that he is real, but that he's just this powerless entity that darts around the earth 
wearing some sort of silly red suit with horns and the pitchfork. You guys know the image I'm talking about. I want to tell you, he is real. He is powerful. And he is darting around the earth. But he's not without aim. He's not aimless. He's got a very specific target. And he's got a very detailed plan. So what I want to do is I want to look at Daniel chapter 1. Turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, we know that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon wanted to rule the world. And his strategy was to take the best and the brightest young men from other nations and transform them from the inside out. Israel was one of the nations that he went to. Four young men from the nation of Israel that he brought back to Babylon were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Nebuchadnezzar forced these young men to learn the language of Babylon, and then he forced them to participate in their religion. He wanted to remove from them everything they'd ever known and to keep them from anything that they had ever hoped to become. Now, I want you to think about something as we talk about identity, identity and destiny. Identity and destiny have always been important to God's people. Isn't that true? Because his promises have always been aimed at those two things. When God speaks out a promise, it'll somehow be in support of who he has called his child to be or what he has called his child to do. People can do something for you, right? People can give you things, right? Only God can call forth your identity and destiny. People can't give you those two things, but they can take them from you. They can rob them from you. They can get you and your life running in reverse. And that is exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do to these young men. And you really see it in Daniel chapter one, verses six and seven. So let's look at that. Daniel one, verse six and seven. It says, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego, or as we call him, Abednego. Now, why would old Nebi want to change their names? Because their names were directly connected to their faith. Let's look at their names. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means the Lord shows grace. Mishael means who is like God. And Azariah means Jehovah has helped. Names in the Bible were a big deal. Like parents didn't play games when it came to names. What a child would be called was a big deal because that name would reflect something. It may have been a family name passed down from previous generations. Maybe it was connected to a significant event that happened sometime around the child's birth. It could be based upon how the mother was feeling at the time of the birth. We see that a few times in scripture. It may have had something to do. Maybe they were waiting to see the apparent personality of the child. Anybody know people who waited a while before they named their babies? You guys know what I'm talking about? Like weeks or even months? Yeah, you've heard of that, right? Well, we just kind of want to watch and wait and see what their little personalities are going to be. It's like, 
We know what their personality is at that age. I mean, what are you going to name your kid? Gaga Goo Goo? You know what I'm saying? I don't know that you see a whole lot in your kid's personality as a newborn, right? Now, some of you might, you might look at that kid and be like, holy mess, that child needs to be named Nightmare or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> It could be that their name, maybe it reflects a prophetic revelation of who that child will become. The point is, is that they were serious about what they called their kids, what their kids' names would be for the rest of their lives. And we are too. We're serious about what we name our kids. We put a lot of thought and effort into our kids' names. Melissa and I put a lot of thought into naming our four kids. I texted my mom a few years ago and asked her where she got my name. And I'll just read you what she texted me back. I named you after a little boy I knew when I was 12. He was 10 years old and he was a preacher's son. His name was Tony Lee. He was funny and he liked to sing. (laughs) Okay, now it's interesting because my name is Tony Lee. I am a preacher, and anyone that knows me knows that I specialize in silly, and I like to sing. Prophetic? I submit that it is. (laughs) I'm not sure if my mom knows what my name means. She might know what it means, but she might not know exactly how prophetic The meaning of my name is to my life. Because Tony means highly praiseworthy. (laughs) Prophetic man, I'm telling you. Now listen, Nebuchadnezzar wanted these young men to forget God. He wanted them to forget God's ways. He wanted them to forget God's will for their lives and adopt his will For their lives. And so, what does he do? He changes their names. Let's look at their Babylonian names. Daniel is God is my judge. Changed his name to Belteshazzar, which means may Baal protect his life. Hananiah means the Lord shows grace. Changed his name to Shadrach, which means command of Aku. Aku was the Babylonian moon god. Mishael means who is like God, changed his name to Meshach, which means who is what a coup is. Azariah means Jehovah has helped. And Abednego means servant of Nabu, which was the Babylonian god of wisdom. You guys, these, these names were meant to be a mockery. These names literally contained the names of Babylonian gods. Mishael, who is like God, changed his name to Meshach, which means who is what a coup is. That's like the exact opposite, right? Complete reverse of what their names meant. These new names were meant to remove their faith, to rob their identity and their destiny. They were meant to steal the hope that God was with them. And for them. But here's what's awesome. It didn't work. Isn't that right? You remember the story? What happened when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire? Right? When they were thrown into the fire for not bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's ridiculously large golden statue, what happened? It says in Daniel chapter 3 that the fire had no effect on their bodies. That the head of their hair wasn't singed. Their clothes weren't damaged. Not even the smell of smoke had come upon them. How does that even happen? It's because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't thrown into the fire. The Lord shows grace was thrown into the fire. Jehovah has helped 
is the one that was put into the flames. Who is like God was tossed into that furnace. These boys didn't face that furnace of fire with fear. They faced that furnace of fire with faith. Our God is able to deliver us from the blazing fiery furnace and from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. You can fill my head with all your philosophies. You can cram your language down my throat. You can even change my name. But I know who I am, and I know my God is with me, and I know my God is for me. They were already prepared for this. They knew Isaiah chapter 43, but now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. Check this out. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. That's what they knew. That's what they stood upon. Amen. Now think about this. What if Azariah had embraced the name Abednego. Maybe Jehovah wouldn't have helped. Maybe the servant of Nabu would have been consumed in that furnace. I wonder how many people are consumed simply because they don't know that God has called them by name and that he's available to walk through the fire with them. I wonder how many people have the smell of smoke on them simply because they've accepted the names that have been given to them by this world. The names, the labels, the words, the accusations, all these things that were meant to shape how and what we think about ourselves. A few years ago, my daughter came home And she was telling us about a young kid in her class who came up to her and said, you stink, which is true some of the time. (laughs) She said, I don't stink. Why do you say I stink? Because you have the same uh, leggings that you wore yesterday. And she said, no, I don't. These are a different pair. No, they're not. You stink. She said, these are a different pair. These aren't the same ones. They look similar, but they're not the same. Yes, they are. You stink. (laughs) So she came home in tears. She was broken, just brokenhearted. I don't stink. So Melissa and I had to talk to her and comfort her and said, well, sweetie, do you know that you don't stink? Yes. (laughs) Do you know that that was a different pair of leggings? Yes. Then what I want you to do is just go up to that boy tomorrow and punch him in the face. Give him a pile drive. Elbow to the... Yeah. No, that's not what we told her to do. <laughs> Although she could. She, she can throw a punch. You know, Proverbs 18.21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And notice that it says death and then life. There's this same tension and release that we find in John 10, 10. The thief has come to destroy, but I have come that they may have life. Whatever is spoken to us or over us has the power to make deposits into our identity or to make withdrawals from our identity. Fortunately, Melissa and I have made enough deposits into her little heart over the years that she wasn't consumed by that fire. Didn't even have the smell of smoke on her. 
And I know that that's probably a silly example to give compared to the fires that some of you may be going through. But what has been said about you? What has been said to you? What accusations have come against you? What labels have been put upon you? What's been spoken so many times in your life that you've just come to believe it? And now you're going in the exact opposite direction of where you'd always hope that you would go simply because of something that was said. You know, when I was reading this, I couldn't help but notice that those three names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were mentioned, they were written 13 times in the story. Four times they came directly from Nebuchadnezzar as he addressed them. One time from the accusing Chaldeans. That's a lot of syllables. Anybody ever tried to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 13 times in a row? That's a tongue twister. That's a lot of words. I don't even do that with my own kids. If I took the time to say Aiden, Cannon, Rowan, Emma Kate, every time I needed something, I would, by the time I said all that, I forgot what I was calling them for to begin with. No, I just say kids. When the boys were younger, before Emma Kate, I would just say boys. And now even still, now that we have Emma Kate, I'll just say boys. And she knows to come running too. Old Nebby could have done that. He could have just said, boys, why ain't you bowing down? But that's not what he did. Nebuchadnezzar took every opportunity that he could to speak those false identities over those boys. Because he wanted who they were to be killed. He wanted what they were called to do to be destroyed. And what were they called to do? Who were they called to be? I mean, we read that they were the sons of Israel, right? In Isaiah chapter 49, God says, Israel, I will make you a light to all the nations of the earth so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. These boys were bred born to boast about God, to bring attention to the Lord. That's what they were called to do. By not embracing those Babylonian names, they immediately positioned themselves to preach the gospel. Did you notice that those four boys' names preach the gospel? God is my judge. Thank goodness the Lord shows grace. Who is like God? Jehovah has helped. <laughs> Each boy's name displayed a characteristic, an attribute of God. But together, they told the whole story. It's kind of like the first four books of the New Testament. Individually, they are called the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. Individually, they tell a, a unique story, a representation of who Jesus is or what he did. Matthew, written really to the Jews, Mark to the Greeks, Luke to the Romans, John really to any believer who could get their hands on it. But together they are the gospels of Jesus Christ. And they tell us the whole story, the whole story of who Jesus is, what he came to do. Amen. Think about where we would be without the book of John. Would we really understand the love of God? We'd be up a creek on scripture memory. So all we got is our John 3.16. That's, that's the only verse some people know. 
You don't have the book of John, you wouldn't even know that one, right? Think about where these three boys would have been that day they were tossed into the fire. If Hananiah, the Lord shows grace, wasn't with them. You picking up what I'm laying down? But here's the thing I really want to point out this morning. The enemy doesn't want to change the identity and destiny of just a single person. He wants the identity and the destiny of the collective. A whole generation. And he always has. But never like now. There is something unique about the last few generations. These are the generations that have seen and are seeing in times prophecies come to pass at a pace that's as fast as the flash. I mean, even what God's been doing in Israel since the early 1900s screams Jesus is coming back really soon. And the enemy knows this. Why do you think that he started putting labels on generations right around the same time Israel became a nation again? You know, the, the rebirth of Israel is a very important end times prophecy. Does anyone know when Israel became a nation again? 1948. Look at the labels on an entire generation. Look at those. And just use, use your memory real quick. Think of all the words and the judgments and the accusations that have come against these generations, spoken over them, spoken against them. The young generation to the old generation, the old generation to the young generation. Words, all kinds of stuff. Six distinct labels on generations. And I know that there have been labels on seasons of history. You got the dark ages, you got the industrial age. I get that. But labeling a generation, like that's new, right? <laughs> We've never seen that. I mean, Israel was called an adulterous generation a few times in the scripture, so maybe we have seen that. But come on. In these days, which are obviously the last days, when the enemy is turning up the heat, it says in Revelation 12, verse 12, that woe to the earth and to the sea because the devil has come down to you and he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. We're getting close to the end. And what does the devil need to do? He needs to take out what may be, and I believe is, the most effective gospel-sharing generations that have ever lived. And he knows he doesn't have a whole lot of time left, so he's working overtime to rob the identity to reverse the calling of this generation. What do you think this whole identity, gender identity thing is? What do you think that is? What do you think that's about? Choose your gender. Pick a pronoun. Change your sexual orientation. While you're at it, change your name. That's what's going on. It's the name game. It's one of the devil's last minute moves. Get a she believing she's a he so that she won't grow up and marry a he. Or a he believing he's a she so that he won't even want to look at a she. Anyone confused yet? <laughs> Listen to me, Satan is trying to call forth the identity and destiny of a generation. But we've already said, only God can call forth our identity and destiny. Now, I want you to hear me. For every one 
of Satan's moves, God has at least one counter move. I would venture to say he would even have 10 or 100 counter moves. He's good like that, right? Remember a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the origins of Babylon and how Babylon originally was called Babel and Babel was established by a man named Nimrod who said, come, let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach into the heavens. Remember the tower of Babel. And he says, let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise we'll be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth, which was God's will. They were supposed to go scatter abroad the face of the earth, right? And multiply there after the flood. I wish I could give more details about this. You can go back and watch and listen. A couple weeks ago, I talked about that. But bottom line, Nimrod was a really bad dude who rebelled against God. He kept people from their calling, which was to spread across the earth. And he promoted the idea of self-worship. Come, let us stop right here and make a name for ourselves. Babel eventually was called Babylon, which is only ever associated with wickedness and Satan's worldly system. There's never anything good said about Babylon, only, only evil. <laughs> but again, like I said, for Every one of Satan's move, God has a counter move. Did you know that at the very same time Satan was moving a man named Nimrod to bring darkness back into the world after the flood, at the very same time God was calling a man named Abram to bring light into the world. Read it. It's right there. Genesis 12, 11 and 12. Nimrod, and the next thing you see is, is Abram, the story of Abram. Some scholars believe that Abram and Nimrod knew each other. I read one commentary that suggested that they actually battled it out one time. I would have loved to have seen that one. God shuts Nimrod down, and the next thing you see is God calling Abram out of, it says, Ur of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon. <laughs> Genesis 12 says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. Sounds like a destiny, doesn't it? I will make your name great. Sounds like an identity. And so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, I want you to listen to me. God is always calling people out of Babylon. He's always calling people out of the world system. He just is. He's always bringing people out of that and into himself, out of the world's darkness, away from the labels, away from the lies, away from the accusations, and giving them a new name. You probably remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. Abram's name was Abram. God changed it to Abraham. His wife, Sarah, God changed her name to Sarah. And the one letter that God added to each of their names is the Hebrew letter, hey. <laughs> and it represents the breath of God. It represents the Holy Spirit. God called Abram and Sarai out of Babylon breathed life into them, changed their identity, gave them a destiny. And here we are today, participators, right? And then what Paul says in Romans, that we have become participators of the blessings and probably been grafted into the blessings and promises that go all the way back to Father Abraham. 
Amen? Yes. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is that whatever you have been told that you are, God says, no, you're not. Whatever lies have been spoken over you, whatever accusations have been made against you, whatever false identities have been promoted in your life, God's saying, that's not true. And God's saying, I want to breathe life into you and change your name and give you the identity I want for you. He changed Abram from Abra, uh, Abram to Abraham. And Sarai, from Sarai to Sarah, he breathed life into them. And I believe that's what some of us need, all of us. You know, we kind of laugh and giggle and make fun of that stereotype of, of a father or a coach or someone significant in your life saying, you'll never amount to anything. But did you know those are real words that are spoken over real people? Happens all the time. That and worse. These lies that we hear so many times that we just believe them. And like we talked about in our freedom class, the enemy is so good at coming behind those lies and reinforcing them so much that it changes our identity and I, our destiny and the trajectory of our life. You may be here this morning and you know that the trajectory of your life is not going in a good direction. And you've never really understood why or how to fix it. It could have to do with things that have been spoken over you. Lies that you've believed. Accusations that you've just surrendered to. And becoming the very thing that someone has said you are. I'm telling you, it's time for you to become the thing that God says that you are. And he says that you are a kingdom and a priest. You are a chosen generation whether you're a teenager or you're one of those boomers or builders that we saw up there, God is saying, I have a plan for you and a destiny. And if you've been off trajectory for a while, that's okay. Abram was old. Sarah was old when he breathed life into them. Amen. Moses was 80 years old when he stepped into his destiny, leading Israel out of Egypt. Would you stand with me? I want you to take a couple of minutes to close your eyes, quieten your heart. And I want you to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you a significant word that's been spoken over you. That lie, that accusation, that thing that you've had internally in your head, in your heart for a long time, and you've maybe never thought about it, but you realize there's something there. Ask the Lord right now, Holy Spirit, will you show me what that lie is? Will you show me that accusation that's been embraced in my life? Someone in the room is hearing the enemy loud and clear right now, and they're hearing the enemy say, God doesn't want to change your name. God can't change your name. Your name's too hard to change. It's not true. Don't believe that. What is that word? What are those negative thoughts, lies that have been rolling around in your head, in your heart? 
that has affected your identity and your destiny that you have embraced, that you have, embo- you have believed. I want to take just a couple more minutes and invite the Holy Spirit to bring the true word, the true the truth about who you are. Ask the Lord, Lord, what is the counter move you have for me here? What's the counter move? The world's been trying to get me to make a name for myself or make a name for me. I don't want the name the world has for me. What name do you have for me? And you guys know I'm not talking about your given born name. I'm talking about God's good and perfect will for your life. Ask the Lord, what is that? And invite him, invite him to bring his counter move. As we were praying, I felt um, the Lord give me a a picture, maybe an idea of um, how the enemy actually likes to bait us with a little bit of truth. He likes to use a little bit of the truth to, it's like a worm on a hook, and it's enough to get us to believe it. And as I was thinking of that and um, praying over that, I feel like one of the things that the enemy might be using in someone or maybe multiple people's lives Um, is a diagnosis that um, a professional or someone labeled you, they told you this thing that, you know, maybe it's some kind of, you know, I think about Tony always referring to his ADD, (laughs) you know, that he has ADD. And it's a true thing. There could be a real disability um, and someone told you that and it got labeled and it's like, okay, and and it's a true thing. Um, But what the enemy has done is he's used that as the hook and as the bait in your life to... um, to convince you that you'll never go beyond that. You'll never go beyond that label. You'll never get beyond that disability, that diagnosis. And I felt like the Lord said, um, but the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. So what it tells us in Hebrews that he speaks a better word. The blood speaks a better word than anything that the world could speak over us. And so I want us to invite right now, Holy Spirit, we're just going to say that you're The blood of Jesus speaks a better word over every diagnosis in Jesus' name. If there's been a diagnosis of some kind of illness or disease or disability, Lord, we just say right now that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word over that. That your blood is meant to cover over, to atone for these things. And the ways that the enemy has been taking a little bit of truth something that could be very true about us. We might have that disability. We might have that illness. He's been trying to rob our identity and our destiny. But Lord, we are saying now that the blood of Jesus has spoken a better word over every single heart and mind in this room. Every single heart and mind. Every lie that he's tried to take and distort and pervert and to tell us that we're never going to measure up, that we're never going to reach the places that you've called us, that we're never going to reach potential, we'll never get to fulfill the things that you've called us to do because of this diagnosis, this label, this disability. We want to cast that down in Jesus' name. Lord, you've told us to take captive anything that puts itself up against the knowledge of God. And here's what we know in the house this morning is God is almighty. And this blood of Christ is atoned over our lives. It's appropriated over our lives. That means it's appropriated over every label, every lie in Jesus' name. We want to walk free this morning. When we leave this, we will leave behind that label and that lie. And we will walk forth in the identity and the destiny and the call of God on our lives because you have spoken a better word. Jesus, Jesus. It's a better word. We reject the lies of the enemy now. In Jesus' name.